Hello, and welcome to Gate to Wisdom. As you can see, it's the third night of Hanukkah, and I have three amazing, amazing stories to tell you. One of them is a shocker you, that you might need to sit down because it's just, it's just a, a real, real mir- life changing of a miracle that, of a story that I'll tell you. So anyway, like I said, it's Hanukkah. So I want to talk to you about when you want something to happen, you have to believe it really, really hard. You have to believe in it. You have to imagine it. Um, and um, like, for example, when you have bitachon and emona, emona is is um, believing in Hashem, totally believing in Hashem. And bitachon is trusting that Hashem will make it happen or trusting Hashem that whatever He does will be good for you. So, and also, when you wake up in the morning, if you're positive, your your image upstairs is also positive. And and that image will follow you for the rest of the day and it will keep, be be happy. You'll be happy the rest of the day. So the way you you are here, you have a mirror of yourself up, upstairs in, in heaven or wherever it is. But um, if you wake up positive and you you go throughout your whole day, you'll see the whole day will be positive. For example, there was once a woman who went to the psychologist and she told the psychologist that every time she picks up her daughter, the daughter always have, has a temper tantrum. She's screaming, she's yelling, and she's so embarrassed to, to take her, her daughter from carpool. And she has to bribe her and she has to do all kinds of things. It's just, uh, it's impossible. So the, the psychologist asked her, how do you feel when you, when you um, go and pick her up? And the psychologist says, well, I feel very unhappy emotionally. I'm drained. Uh, um, I'm not, look, I don't look forward to it. Um, and I, I just don't enjoy it. So the psychologist says, okay, I want you to, the whole day after you dropped off your daughter, before picking her up, I want you to think how beautiful your daughter is, how much you love her. Be mindful of holding her hand and, and, and be mindful that you yourself have a smile on your face and your, your, your face is relaxed and you're relaxed and everything is amazing and this is your daughter and you love her so much. And think positive and think, no, she's not going to have a temper tantrum. No, she's not going to scream. No, I don't have to bribe her either. She's going to walk gently with me. She's going to be a beautiful girl. And the mother tried. She really did. And she walked home herself and she took these deep breaths and she really relaxed and she says, no, I'm going to pick up my daughter and yep, it's going to be great. I'm going to hold her hand and she's going to love me and everything. The mother went to pick up the daughter. Guess what happened? The mother had the best time of her life because the daughter saw the mother's image. The mother was relaxed. The mother was happy. The mother emotionally, physically, mentally, she felt that she was not stressed. The daughter felt about it. They had the most wonderful time walking to the car and coming home and enjoying the rest of the evening. Being mindful, being mindful of, of, of where you are at that moment is extremely important. And, and always, 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 this is very hard to do. Always have a positive attitude, to, 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 no, no matter what. That is very, very difficult. But when you're going towards doing something and it's a positive attitude, everything works out. You know, it 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 it, it um, makes the whole environment, the whole surroundings, positive, and um, and things work out. Oh, I want to talk, tell you a little secret before I tell you the, the three stories that are amazing. The, the last one is the, 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 the best one. But I want to tell you 
something about Hanukkah that I learned and I want to share with you. Here's a Chomash Achitas. And if you open your, your uh, Chomash and you count 28, you count 25 in your Chomash, if you count 25 words from, from the word Bereshis, and you count 25 words, you'll come to the letter O. You'll come to the letter O. And, and, and it shows you that 25, which is Hanukkah, um, and you, when you count 25 words and you come to the letter, it ends up at, tw- at, at O. And O is light for Hanukkah. So, here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 23, 24. Here. But here all. Exactly 25 words from Bereshis. I thought that was it. That, that was interesting. Um, that in, in the Bereshis, 25 words later, you come to the, uh, to the, to the word all, which is all, all about Hanukkah, the light. Anyway, um, and the reason we celebrate um, Hanukkah, as we know, it's um, it really the the light really only we only uh, need seven days. So why are we celebrating seven days? Is eight step eight, but the eighth candle, the first candle, is part of the eight. Also, why aren't we celebrating the the victory of Hanukkah? You know. Why aren't we doing the the, the Maccabees and say that the Maccabees really won the war? And the reason is because eventually they'll forget that God helped the Maccabees win the war. So that's why God decided to make the miracle of the lighting of the menorah. The menorah should last for eight days. That little um, oil that lasted supposed to last for one day, but it lasted for eight days, to say that the miracle came from above. And it wasn't just the Maccabees that was victorious because they were strong. They were strong because God helped them. And to remember that the Almighty God um, makes all the miracles in life happen. Anyway, so that's why um, we celebrate the light and not really the victory and um, and not seven. Um, so anyway, now I'll tell you the very first story. The first story, it's called The Menorah to the Rescue. This story takes place in Spain, in Teldo. Um, Madrid is the capital of Spain. So it's like south of Madrid is there's a city, used to, or maybe still is a city called Teldo. Um, and um, there was this man and his name, and this was this happened in the 1400s. And um, that's when there was a lot of um, crusades and, and a lot of Jews had to convert um, as uh, secretly or whatever. So anyway, there was this man, his name was Don um, Manuel. And he was about to die, about to pass on. So he called his son Isaac. He said, Isaac, I don't have any money for you. I'm not a wealthy man. Uh, when I die, just promise me one thing. I have this menorah that uh, has been passed down for, for many generations. It belonged to my father. It belonged to my grandfather. It belonged to my great-grandfather. And this menorah has done many miracles for us. Please, whatever you do, keep it with you and don't sell it. This menorah is very special. And then the father passed on. And then, and um, and sure enough, the Inquisition was about, was coming very close to their, to their uh, city. And the priest came to visit um, Isaac. And uh, he gave his condolences that his father is passing away. But he says, you know what? I came to warn you. You know, I'm very good to the Jews, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Anyway, so he says, you need to know that it's going to be very, very rough for you because I know your family is not going to convert and the Inquisition is coming and it's going to be concentrated right here in Taldo in Spain. So please, if you can, get out, get out of Spain. And 
Isaac said, but I don't have any money. I don't, I don't have anything. The priest says, I can't help you. I just came to warn you. And he left. I, so that the, the, the next day it was going to be Hanukkah. And uh, Isaac quickly ran to a captain of the ship that was going to be sailing the, you know, the next day. And he says to the captain, please, my wife and, ch and children have to, have to escape right away. Please, can you take me on your boat away from Spain? And the captain says, sure. Um, do you have any money? And he says, no, I don't have any money. I have nothing. But if you take me to Holland, um, I have a very rich uncle there. He will pay for whatever money you want if you save our life and bring us safely. They promise you he'll give it to you. The captain says, sorry, no deal. I am not taking you or anybody unless I get, unless I have money. And poor Isaac didn't have anything. He had no collateral. He had nothing. He was so depressed. He didn't know what to do. And that night was Hanukkah. And he says, you know, I don't mind giving up my life for, for, for what my, fa for my father, you know, not to sell the menorah, but how could I expect my, to, to sacrifice also my children and my wife not to sell this menorah? And by the way, I don't have money even to buy oil for this menorah. I, I don't understand. Um, how could this be? And Isaac was very, very distraught. And he just took the menorah and started looking at it. And things came into his mind of the miracle and this, what is the symbol, what it stands for. So he started polishing. He started polishing the menorah really nicely. And he says, I, I, I don't have money. I have to choose whether buying oil for the menorah or supper for my kids. I can't, I can't do that. What, what's this use of this menorah to me? I could, I could save, sell it and, and be able to move away from here. So what had happened when he was polishing, something came loose and 12 gold coins fell from the menorah, from the bottom of the menorah. And he quickly picked it up and he says, wow. He ran to the captain, gave him some of the few coins, had one coin for himself to buy oil for the menorah. And that menorah saved their life. And uh, they escaped and they es escaped the Inquisition. And that menorah was an heirloom, um, an antique in their life. For, for many, many generations, and they escaped. And um, they, they got out of Spain. The other, the second story, it's called A Spark in the Dark. Okay, this is, this is a hard one. Anyway, a rabbi in the concentration camp came to all his friends and said, it's Hanukkah tonight. Um, and one person yelled, yeah, go ahead, get your candles, get your menorah, get your oil. He says, look where we are. See that smoke over there? That's for us. They're going to, they're going to kill us. They're going to burn us in these, in these, um, gas chambers. What are you talking about? Menorah right now. But the old rabbi continued. He says, we don't need menorahs. We, we ourselves, are, our, our, our bodies are the wick, and our neshama is, is the light, is the, is the fire. And just as he was about explaining about candles and explaining about the menorah, this Kopak, who's, a, who's, a, who's like a sergeant, a, a horrible person that the Nazis uh, uh, kept in charge, they called a K. K O K A P O Kip Kapo, you know, keep them in charge of, of all the Jews and keep everybody in line. So this Kapo, um, Kapo, he said, You filthy Jews, I know today is your holiday. I know today is your, your, um, Hanukkah. So I have a big surprise for you. Yeah, you filthy Jews. 
Number one, I have prepared a boil, um, I prepared a boiling soup for you, and I will pour it in your arms. Secondly, um, every every man, every ten um, people, every tenth person will get a loaf of bread, one loaf of bread, and that person has to cut it evenly for 10 people without using a knife. The third thing is, I'm going to give you um, two grams of, of margarine, and you're going to lick it off your fingers. And then when he came to the old man, he says, oh man, I'm going to give you a little bit more of the margarine. And I'm going to, and he drops it on the floor and he says to him, now you old man, you go down and you lick the margin off the floor. And the rabbi complied and he went down. And as he was licking, he was taking the pieces of margin and putting it into his lapel, the little pieces of margin as he was picking it up. And when he was done, the 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 this, um, the Nazi says, "I'll be back in one hour to give you your hot soup and to give you your piece of bread." And he left. The rabbi showed all the people in the camp, "Look, I have all this margarine that I collected. It's on my on my lapel." And another person says, "Oh my goodness." I have buttons, and his buttons. They took off the they took off the material, and the buttons were made out of metal, and so the metal they turned it around, and they put the margarine on the button that was made out of metal, and they put it on the windowsill, and they lit the menorah, and they they had two little flickering lights, um, or one flickering lights. Um, on the windowsill and they were singing and they were saying the bracha. All of a sudden, the, the, the Nazi came back screaming and yelling at them. Because of that light on the, on, on the windowsill, the, the emergency uh, thing went off and, and, and it's crazy in here. Because of the, that light, everything is ruined now and we have to do everything now. And, um, and it destroyed his plans of bringing hot burning soup onto their hands so that little little light on the windowsill saved um, all those people in that concentration concentration camp from this horrible person that was going to um, make their life even more miserable so that's story number two um, story number three is I want you to, if you, if you want to, you could sit down. Anyway, this story, it, um, it was written, we just digest the story, and uh, it's, it's a shocker. Okay. Marcel Steinberg, um, this took place in 1939, and he decided in the middle of the day that instead of going to work, he has a very, very sick friend that's almost dying. I'm going to go visit him. Now, Marcel has never taken this train before. He doesn't even know how to take this train in, in Brooklyn. And it's in the middle of the day. He doesn't know where he's going. I mean, you know, he's never done this. But his friend is sick, and he was going to go to it. So um, he decided to get on this train, which has never been on it before. And um, and usually at this time, in the middle of the day, he's walking. But he got onto the train. The train was extremely crowded. But the person next to him got, got off. And then another man came and dashed uh, straight to him and sat down beside him. This man was reading a newspaper. And um, Steinberger was looking at the newspaper. And he decided it was in Polish. And Steinberg's nose Polish. And the guy was looking in the classified ads. So Steinberg's asked him, excuse me, are you are you looking for a job? He says, no. 
Why are you looking in the classified? He says, are you looking for a wife to get married? He says, no, no. Um, he says, I'm looking for the, the man looking at the newspaper. He said, I'm looking for my wife. And he says, I'm from um, Hungary and uh, the Balkan in Hungary. And the Germans took me to bury the Germans' dead bodies. But I don't know anything about my wife. I don't know if she um, uh, is alive or taken to the concentration camp. I don't know if she, 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 where she is. So I came to um, America to see if I could find her. Because when they were liberated, all those people were taken to America. So, and I have no contact. I don't know what to do. So Steinberg is thinking that he was just at a party not, not too long ago. And he met this woman also from the same city uh, um, in Hungary. And he remembers that, he's, that she, she had told him that, his wife, that the husband was taken away by the Germans to bury dead bodies. So he says, um, and he had written her phone number down, and he said that, you know, we'll, we'll go out soon, you know, sometime. We'll, we'll, we'll get together sometime. So then Steinberg looks at the guy with the newspaper and says, what is your wife's name? And he says, my wife's name is Maria, Maria Paskin. He says, okay, I want you to get off at the next station with me. And Steinberg took out his note from his pocket and yeah, he remembered, this is the name, Maria Paskin. And he tells the man to wait outside the phone booth and he goes in and he doesn't tell the man anything, goes in and he makes a phone call in the those old-fashioned um, phone booths. And as he's calling, the phone is ringing and ringing and ringing. And finally, after many rings, a woman picks up the, picks up the phone. And, and Steinberg says to Marcel Steinberg, tells to that lady, Maria, do you remember who I am? I'm Marcel Steinberg. I met you at the party. And she says, yes, I do. And then she sa he says, what was your husband's name that was taken away by the Germans? And she says his name was um, Bella pa uh, Paskin, Bella Paskin. And he says, Maria, you are going to experience the best miracle of your life. And he gives the phone to the man outside who obviously was a husband and he lets them go in and he's watching from outside. He sees the man hitting himself on the head. He sees the man shrieking. He sees the man crying that he found his, his wife. Marcel, with tears in his eyes, walked away. Now, there's no way that this is chance, right? There's no way. How does Marcel, in the middle of the day, decide to go visit his dying friend in the middle of the day when he's usually working? He's never taken that train before. And right beside him comes the same man that belongs to that wife that he met at a party. <laughs> no chance, right? Absolutely no chance. In, in Regis Dreyfus, the story was written and it said that on that train, the Almighty God was riding on that Brooklyn train to make the story come and for them to find each other. <sighs> we are put on this earth. Every day is a different day. It, it's easier said than done, but take your time. Take your time to be mindful, 
to know where you are, where you're walking, what you're seeing, what you're what you're saying, what be mindful of of of, of your surroundings and be happy. That's the most important thing. And things will turn around and good things will happen. Because when you're happy, you make other people happy. Oh, I could tell you one more thing. Uh, what, what, once, once, one more small um, thing about a professor. There was this professor and he told everybody to blow up these balloons. And everybody blew up the balloon, but they had to put their names on it and then throw it into a big hallway. And then this professor said, okay, now I'm going to give you five minutes, five minutes to go find your own balloon. And so the, the, they, they tried that and not a single person found their balloon. But with like he had 200 students in this big Calisili, Calisili, this big auditorium that they did. And they couldn't, nobody could find their own balloon. So then he said, okay, come back, let go of the balloons. Okay, now I want you to go pick any balloon, just one balloon, and give it to the person that it belongs to. So sure enough, and he gave them five minutes to do it. Within five, before five minutes was up, everybody had in the, in the auditorium, everybody had their own balloon. The professor was trying to teach. We're all looking for happiness, but you can't find it. But if you make somebody else happy, and you put a smile on somebody else, then you will have happiness. I thought you'll enjoy it. So I guess that's four stories. Mm -hmm.